Hello and welcome to Shaka Extra Time, a show appearing live on Facebook and Twitter. And joining me in studio is Shaka Sal himself, aka the Kabale Kid. Hello, Shaka. Hello, Paul. How are you? You will be terrific, my brother, especially today when you have two very important European teams with incredible African diaspora representation meeting for the World Cup, you know, semi-finals. Well, I'm looking forward to that uh, game. Uh, but uh, before we get to that, uh, let's uh, welcome all our Facebook and Twitter uh, uh, followers are watching us uh, live uh, from all over the world. Shaka Extra Time is a place where you get to ask questions, uh, talk to Shaka, and uh, talk about uh, politics and, and issues that uh, you care about. So, Shaka, let's get to it. Uh, let's start uh, with uh, the World Cup. Uh, today, uh, another interesting game. Uh, most of my favorite teams are out, uh, but uh, we have at least France and Belgium uh, taking us uh, to the same finals. Your thoughts? You have, of course, uh, Belgium and you have uh, Lukaku, a man who happens to be our neighbors, really, coming from the DRC and we come from Uganda and all kind of stuff. And in fact, we happen to come from um, a region that uh, directly borders the DRC. Not to mention, of course, that those uh, um, borders that I consider very artificial. Yes, um, frankly, I would say that um, I would like to see Belgium uh, move to the finals and uh, take it all because it has never done that in its history. And of course, you do have uh, not only Lukaku, but you have some other brothers who happen to represent the African diaspora. And of course, they're also meeting France. France, the last time I checked, out of a roster of about 22 players, Paul, you're talking about, uh, is it 14 or 15? It's about that. Can you imagine? The African diaspora. Well, they should call it an African team playing in a European league, maybe, if, they, if that works. <laughs> they could have done that back in 1998, of course, when France won it all uh, in Stade de uh, France with virtually, virtually an African diaspora team. Uh, how do you see Croatia, Croatia and uh, England, uh, the match that is coming up tomorrow? It's incredible because Croatia is a very, very small country, by the way. It's one of those uh, uh, countries that uh, used to be one of these giant countries called Yugoslavia and uh, uh, Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia. But now Yugoslavia has since split into about seven or eight different countries, and Croatia happens to be one of them. But I honestly, uh, again, here in this particular case, I favor England. Not that um, it happened to be the colonial master of where I come from, uh, Uganda, but also I happen to have a soft spot for the fact that it does have several, uh, you know, players who happen to look like you and me. Uh, interesting, Shaka. For me, uh, personally, I actually like uh, Croatia. I usually like uh, the small uh, countries or the underdogs, the people who have not uh, been uh, seen uh, to play well, uh, who are underestimated originally. Uh, you talk about uh, teams. Uh, when you look at England, uh, you look at France, mm. uh, you look at uh, Belgium. Uh, those are countries that uh, could potentially, uh, one could argue that these are countries that have had it all. Yes. Uh, but Croatia is a small country, so my favorite in this, uh, going into the semifinals, is Croatia. Your thoughts? I understand. Uh, yeah. And in fact, let's face it, uh, maybe uh, the audience may not actually know this, but the fact is that there was a time that a very, very small country uh, from Latin America called uh, Uruguay, one it all, not once, but twice. Uruguay, about population today, about 3 million people. Uh, any predictions for today, uh, England versus Belgium? Uh, England versus Belgium, by the way, is, uh, I think, taking place tomorrow? Or is it, uh, yeah, tomorrow. I think they play tomorrow. Uh, again, I am not a prophet. and. Um, I don't feel no, very no, comfortable. That's whoever wins uh, today's match. Uh, if, uh, uh, if, let's say, France beats uh, Belgium, uh, whoever wins uh, will meet uh, either Croatia or England. Uh, that is correct. Uh, uh, after tomorrow. That is correct. Yeah. They, um, no, um, you know, today is one semi final. <laughs> then tomorrow. Then tomorrow, another semi final. And then uh, on Saturday, 
uh, you have the consolation match where you 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 decide uh, i mean at least you get the to know who ends up number three and number four and then on a sunday it is the real thing well I can't wait to watch uh, the World Cup uh, finals. I wouldn't mind, of course, uh, having uh, um, Belgium uh, meeting with uh, England. But who knows, it could even be, in fact, uh, the traditional and historical rivals between France and England. Who knows? Well, I'm taking uh, money on this one. Uh, who are you betting on? I am not betting. I'm eminently underqualified <laughs> to do that. <laughs> okay, let's move along. Let's go to <laughs> let's go to Ethiopia and Eritrea. Uh, once again, uh, we've been talking about uh, this uh, remarkable uh, young man uh, who's uh, the current uh, prime minister of uh, Ethiopia for a while now. Uh, Abiy Ahmed seems to be on it again. He, for the first time in nearly 20 years, he's gone to Eritrea and sat down with the Eritrean uh, president, uh, Esayas Afawaki. Uh, what, uh, uh, what an achievement uh, that's uh, been so far. Incredible, Paul. I mean, uh, I saw the smiles on uh, those you know, individual leaders' faces downtown Asmara. I saw these beautiful women you know, dancing and all that kind of stuff. You can't believe that uh, you know, it's about 20 years ago that these people spent about two years killing each other. And the total number, at least formally, uh, officially, is about 80,000 human beings um, who died during uh, that really um, dumb war, some people will say it. Yeah. Um, it is incredible that, um, you know, so far two countries, uh, frankly, uh, that you would have considered to be made up of brothers and sisters, uh, have finally seen some kind of reason. And let's face it, uh, Abi Ahmed um, is not only talking the talk, he's actually walking the talk so that the Horn of Africa can actually walk the walk. We having now, sincerely, I think what we have is uh, re-establishing the normal relationships mm. between Addis Ababa and Asmara. Uh, and so far, uh, telephone communications between Addis Ababa and Asmara have been re-established for the first time in the last 20 years. Uh, we also expect to see the uh, Ethiopian Airways uh, taking off from uh, Bole International Airport at Addis Ababa heading to Asmara next week. Mm -hmm. um, there are also plans, of course, of reopening uh, the respective embassies uh, so that uh, uh, the two countries can again um, work together just like they did more than 20 years ago. So this is very good news for everybody because uh, you think about the kind of money they have been spending, some others might say, wasting on defense, guarding these uh, porous borders in Syria, which are very difficult to secure, by the way. Mm. You spent a lot of money. It's like throwing money in the hole. This money can now actually be diverted uh, to doing what it should do in the first place, providing the necessary uh, service delivery, really, to their people. So I think it's a very good thing. And in fact, I heard that uh, the United Nations uh, Secretary General mm -hmm. uh, Guterres says that uh, he thinks the UN sanctions, for example, with what has now happened, actually become obsolete. And I think even the international community, the rest of the international community, is going to be looking at Eritrea as, uh, um, you know, a newly beautiful, gorgeous lady. Even Igad, of which Eritrea used to be part of, is actually opening up again and uh, welcoming Eritrea back with the red carpet. Uh, it's uh, quite uh, interesting, uh, uh, rather fascinating, uh, in a sense that uh, uh, in, in America here, we are looking about building walls. Uh, in Eritrea, these guys are saying, hey, uh, we don't need to build walls. We just need to be brothers and sisters. Great point, Paul, great point. Uh, uh, what makes uh, this guy uh, tick, uh, the, the uh, Ethiopian prime minister? How come he's able to do certain things that uh, other leaders have not been able to do? What keeps him going? I think he's a very uniquely gifted individual. Uh, he joined the rebels of uh, 
uh, TPRF when he was very, very young. And uh, he, uh, he did it to the suggestion of uh, his boss and mentor, Mary Sizenawi, uh, to hit the books. And the guy who had like been a high school or a school dropout ended up not only hitting the books and getting one degree or two degrees, but in fact, three degrees. The guy has a PhD. And the guy was a lieutenant general mm. in the Ethiopian army. The guy was pretty much very high up there in intelligence and all that kind of stuff. So he's a guy that um, knows how things work and what have you. And also he happens to come from uh, an ethnic community uh, called um, the Oromo, who happen to be the majority and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, he's probably the kind of guy that um, really was destined to make history because from what I know so far, and uh, you may correct me if I am wrong, he probably happens to be the first indigenous Oromo to occupy that very most powerful office in recent modern history mm. in Ethiopia. The Oromos have never had anybody up there. Mm. Uh, it, it takes uh, two to tango. Uh, wouldn't you, uh, for example, give credit uh, to the Eritrean guy? Because uh, he could have easily said, no, I'm not interested in peace. Well, you could say that he could have done that. The problem is, uh, does he, in fact, have any cards to play? But he has sustained it for nearly 20 years. Yeah, right? but under some of the most difficult conditions. Because let's face it, uh, it's not only uh, Abiy Ahmed uh, that, in fact, is a rising star. Even Ethiopia, in terms of economics, uh, is a rising star. It's one of the fastest growing economies on the African continent. It obviously has uh, potentially more than 105 million people who are going to be consumers. And uh, it is opening up uh, in terms of economically and what have you. Uh, it has actually been uh, uh, growing in terms of economic growth uh, percentages. Uh, it has been actually growing around 10%, my friend, for more than a decade and what have you and that kind of stuff. Whereas on the other hand, Eritrea, uh, which probably is uh, under 4 million you know, human beings, uh, uh, Eritrea has actually been um, an isolated sort of country. Uh, not so many people really have been willing to do business with Eritrea. Eritrea is pretty much has been closed, really. And the young people who happen to be the majority, given the kind of changing demographics and what have you, have actually been running away heading to Europe and any other place, but stay in Eritrea. So I think this was like um, a God-given opportunity, sincerely, even for a man as stubborn, really, uh, as patriotically Eritrean, as uh, Isaias Afawaki. You could see a huge smile on that man. Mm. You could see that smile, my friend. Uh, you could actually have... Uh, uh, you know, um, sold it for a great price. I think he's, uh, right now, he's in a very, very much better uh, position than he was actually a couple of days ago. Uh, you are watching uh, Shaka Extra Time, uh, a show that only comes to you live on Facebook and Twitter, and uh, we are taking your questions and comments. Uh, please, uh, if you would like to participate, uh, just send us a question or comment, and uh, we'll uh, get back to you. Uh, so, Shaka, uh, let's uh, cross over to uh, South Sudan. Uh, we've been talking about uh, peace talks, peace talks, but in one could maybe make a joke of it and say they're peace jokes, uh, because we don't see anything tangible coming out of these. Uh, they had a meeting in uh, uh, the Sudan uh, capital, Khartoum, now they're in Entebbe. Yesterday they were in Entebbe, Uganda. They come up with all these agreements that don't hold. Your thoughts? Yes, you're right. Uh, they have actually been to... There are some people who have equally characterized them, as you did, uh, as uh, peace jokes. And uh, others have actually uh, likened them uh, to a couple planning a marriage while concentrating on a divorce. Uh, but look, that country has suffered so much, especially the, old, the ordinary people. The ordinary people who do not have really uh, independent means 
took a counter living. Mm. Um, these elite who are at the top, well, both the government and some of the uh, big rebels, um, it's quite possible that uh, they have some kind of uh, independent means of uh, livelihood because when you look at some of the reports, uh, the investigations that have been conducted on that country, uh, you will find that, uh, for example, a man like uh, Sarvakir Mayadid uh, has very huge, uh, you know, mansions in the upscale um, Lavington in the Kenyan capital Nairobi, and uh, you could probably have other places in South Africa and what have you, huge bank accounts and you name it, so it doesn't matter. But let's face it, the ordinary person either becomes a refugee in his or her own country, and there are almost two million people who happen to be in that club. And then you have also more than two million people who are also refugees living in some of those neighboring countries. And the majority actually, um, according to what I have seen, live in Uganda. Um, in, yeah, some of them live probably a bit okay, but most of them, frankly, live in subhuman conditions. So I think it's a high time, sincerely, that uh, um, these leaders, if they are to claim leadership at all, because others might probably characterize them as rulers, but if they are leaders, sincerely, they should feel for their people, because otherwise uh, they will probably be seen to be uh, uh, socially, economically, and politically insensitive to their people. And frankly, that should not be part of African culture, at least the traditional African culture. I'm not talking about uh, the culture of the African who is like you and me, who somehow has become something different. Uh, before we go to the comments, uh, let me uh, maybe do a follow-up. Uh, uh, obviously, yesterday's uh, talks uh, talked about uh, reinstalling all uh, Riyad Macha as the first uh, vice uh, president, uh, but then the rebel, one of the rebel groups that uh, he supposedly represents uh, said no, they are not uh, agreeing to that. Uh, it's like we are going back to where we were even originally before this whole thing broke out. As a matter of fact, it's not only his rebel group, uh, the other alliance of rebels also do not like uh, what they see because they still think that uh, uh, President uh, Sarvakir Mayadid uh, continues to hold too much power. Uh, for example, you have a guy called uh, General uh, Tabandengai. Mm. This is a man who had a split from uh, Riyako Machar and uh, has, had actually been taken advantage of by uh, Sarvakir and Sarvakir supporters, including Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni, and also including uh, Kenyan President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta at one time, mm. uh, they had looked at him as somebody who was an alternative to Dr. Riyaka Machar. Um, so they called him, uh, or considered him to be a leader of the SPRO-MIO. But let's face it, he had absolutely nothing to deliver. General Taban Dengai one time came here, we even talked uh, on telephone. He went to meet some uh, uh, South Sudanese diaspora and what have you. To be very honest with you, there were probably more empty chairs in that room uh, than, in fact, the people that were present. And he has another guy called uh, Ezekiel Gatkwath, mm. who happens to be Minister for Petroleum. Mm. The uh, former ambassador. The former acting ambassador, or whatever they called it right here. Mm. These guys do not have followers, at least in the last couple of two years, or the last two years they have been in those positions, what they have been able to demonstrate, Paul, is that, yes, they may be leaders, but when they look back, there are no people following them. Not even the entire South Sudanese diaspora living in the United States, mm. and largely whose epicenter is like Nebraska. They can't even walk there. They can't even go there. Mm. But somehow, these arrangements insist that Taban Dengai remains as one of the four vice presidents. They're introducing four vice presidentships. I don't know for what. Th that's this is not about peace talks in Dugu. This is not about easing uh, really uh, situations for the ordinary person or individual in South Sudan. It seems to me, frankly, unless 
you can contradict me with the facts. But this is simply about sharing positions. Individuals sharing positions, they call you a first vice president. Another one is called uh, a vice president. Another one probably called an assistant president. Mm. That kind of stuff. Yeah. It reminds me of a deal that Riyak got into with, with Al-Bashir back in the late 90s, which actually made him one of the four assistant presidents. And he had probably an office, but nothing. You have a title. You have an office. No authority. Well, no in budget. Interesting, Shaka. Let's uh, go to uh, uh, some of the Facebook comments are coming in on the same uh, topic. Uh, Mr. Shaka, how does a president who failed to work with the opposition in his country uh, be called to unite two opposing parties in uh, South Sudan? Does that make sense? Which country is he talking about? I think he's referring to both Uganda and Sudan. What do you mean, uh, Uganda has... Uh, uh, well, uh, this is from Tom Bogare, a Facebook comment. Uh, yeah. He wants to know how can a president who has failed to work with the opposition in his country be called to unite two opposing parties in South Sudan? It's very interesting because, you see, even during colonialism, uh, they basically said, uh, do as I say, but not as I do. Yes? Ugandan president, for example, does not, in fact, interact routinely with the opposition uh, members as if, in fact, they are not legitimate Ugandans. But yet, he seems that he has the moral authority to be a mediator in issues that are beyond his borders. It's very, very contradictory. Uh, let's go to another comment. Uh, L. M. Prezo. Uh, hello, Shaka. Do you see any light uh, to the peace agreement between Salva Kiyo and uh, Riyak Macha? Or are both leaders using th this to buy time? I think part of the problem, sincerely, is that uh, this kind of peace initiative and what have you is not coming out of them, from, you know, inside them. This is a sort of process. Uh, this is a sort of arrangement that seems to be imposed from outside. In this particular case, you have two key players here. And I, I, I say two key players because Ugandan, Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni uh, is someone that, uh, at least there is evidence, who strongly supports or backs Salvaquil. In fact, there is evidence uh, to the extent that uh, the, the Ugandans have actually been even providing armaments weapons and what have you, to Sarovakir. And in fact, I remember there is a time uh, about probably about uh, four years ago or three years ago when the rebels nearly actually seized or took over Juba. And it was the Ugandan forces which came in and secured the international airport and what have you and actually were able to, in a sense, rescue uh, the government of Salvaki, which was probably about collapse. And then you have also people who say uh, the president of Sudan, uh, we're talking about Al Bashir, Field Marshal Al Bashir, and all kind of stuff, uh, also happens to support the other faction, the SPRIO, which of course is led by Riyak Machar. Uh, and so these two people have come to the conclusion that they are not get, gaining anything by the status quo because their economies, both of them, are not doing very well. And so it is in their interest to make sure that there is some at least semblance of peace in Ijuba because without that, it's quite possible that both of them, the man in Khartoum and the man in Kampala, could actually be in trouble economically and probably even politically. And also the United Nations Security Council has also come up very, very strongly that you know what? You have to accept to live together. You may not have to love one another, but you are sort of condemned, so to speak, politically, to live and coexist together. Just like Absolutely. a couple living in the house, but uh, they are not technically married, right? Probably staying, in fact, in different uh, bedrooms. Who knows? <laughs> Interesting. But, but, but the thing is, at the end of the day, frankly, we need to have some peace, really. And genuine peace, I'm talking about genuine peace, 
because the people of South Sudan deserve it. Uh, let's go to another comment, this time around uh, in, uh, from Rane Kaseya Sa in Ndola, Zambia. It says, uh, we need a divine intervention. America is failing to remove Kabila by force. Uh, it's really taken long. DRC has suffered for a long time. We as neighbors, we want to see some light in uh, DRC. Yeah, well, I think uh, there should really be um, some kind of, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, light at the end of the tunnel coming into DRC because at least we are promised that uh, uh, there are going to be democratic elections uh, on December 23rd, 2018. So this is July. We probably have to be a bit patient. But something very interesting also occurred yesterday. I saw that um, the incumbent president of DRC, Joseph Kabira, uh, refused uh, to meet with the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Nikaide. You know, <laughs> she was there last time. I think it was last year. Mm. They met for about 90 minutes. And apparently, uh, she really was, um, at least uh, socially, politically, and environmentally, uh, and friendly. And so I think uh, the president of DRC does not think that uh, there should be another round of uh, discussions. Um, so I think at the end of the day, let's face it, it's up to the people of the Democratic, Democratic Republic of the Congo to make sure that uh, there is a government in the place uh, that uh, is a reflection of their interests and concerns. Because when you talk about the Americans, uh, you know, the Americans are not really anything close to uh, manna from heaven. When you think about uh, uh, historically the political context of the Congo, because let's face it, they have not been on this, on this, on the, on the, they have not been really on the right side of history when it comes to helping the Congo um, to be a viable society. I think at the end of the day, that should really be up to the Congolese themselves to uh, figure it out. Very briefly, what are you talking about uh, tomorrow on uh, Straight Talk Africa? Tomorrow we are looking at um, an institution uh, that is uh, known as the African Union, uh, which uh, was launched uh, in uh, 2002 in Durban, South Africa. We are looking at whether or not uh, it actually makes sense to have that type of institution. Uh, we're looking, therefore, at uh, its significance or lack of it, because there are some critics, in fact, who are saying it is increasingly looking like uh, um, a think tank of sorts. Uh, very briefly, let's go to our final comment. Dixon A. Mussolini in Kagera, Tanzania. Uh, Shaka, where do you see uh, my country, Tanzania, in the next five years under President Amagufuli? I, I really don't know, but um, it looks like, uh, of course, uh, there is a mixed bag when you look at the report card of President uh, John Pombe Magufuli. He probably doesn't drink, but you see the second name Pombe implies that, uh, you know, there is something like being intoxicated probably with power because he may not actually be drinking alcohol or drugs and stuff like that. He has done some good things. For example, they launched, uh, uh, they, he launched, or relaunched, what you call uh, Tanzania Airlines. And um, yesterday, I think they actually received or launched the Dreamline aircraft. Incredible. So Tanzania is going to be in business, but in terms of civil liberties and what have you, he has, frankly, his work cut out for him. Yeah, in, uh, we have to cut you short. Uh, let's uh, take, uh, uh, thank you so much uh, for being a, a guest. I look forward to hosting you on another edition of Shaka Extra Time. Until then, uh, so long from Washington. Mm -hmm.